original artist from Queensland. He really lets me have it. You mentioned with DNA testing that you've got now will trace us back to Africa. Uh, I don't believe that. Why yeah. not? Because if, if, if our story is incorrect, you know, if, 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 if they are a myth, the way that you guys might believe they are, uh, and we know they're not, why isn't it possible that the Africans actually come from us? You know, we branched out from here. Yeah. It's complicated to explain. In a way, what I'd like you to think about the DNA stories we're telling is that they are that, they are DNA stories. That's our version as Europeans of how the world was populated and where we all trace back to. That's our song line. Yeah. We use science right. to, to tell us about that because we don't have this sense of direct continuity. Our ancestors didn't pass down the stories. We've lost them and we have to go out and find them. And we use science, which is, which is a European way of looking at the world, to do that. You guys don't need that. You've no, got, your, don't own, need you've that. got we, your own stories. We know where we come from. We know about creation. We know we come from here. Mm. We didn't come from nowhere else. This really isn't going very well. Tradition rarely sits well with cutting-edge science. The Aborigine songlines say that mankind originated here in Australia. No stories about journeys. But the blood of Aborigines tells me that they've inherited a very ancient marker from Africa. It's around 50,000 years old, while Africans have no trace of Aboriginal markers in their blood. The human traffic was strictly one way, from Africa to Australia. The big question is, what route did they take? 50,000 years ago, the Ice Age had locked up the world's water. Sea levels were lower, making Indonesia one landmass. Australia was joined to New Guinea. Since then, rising sea levels have covered up any trace of their presence along this route. If these first African migrants traveled this road, then their genes and the elusive Australian marker might survive somewhere. I'm going to India to see if I can find any genetic trace of the Africans en route to Australia. If I can, it'll be the first direct evidence that native Australians came this way. Let's go see if we can make history. Madurai in southern India. My mission? To try and find the missing link. I'm looking for the genetic marker found today in Australian Aborigines that shows their ancestors traveled through India on their journey to their new home. It's incredible to be here and it really is like diving into a sea of humanity. There's so many faces. It's a long shot, but someone out there may be carrying the genetic link I'm looking for. To help me track down the marker, I've enlisted the help of an old friend, Professor Pitchapan. We'll use his lab and its equipment for as long as it takes. He took me off to a quiet cafe so we could talk. Quiet by Madurai standards, that is. We've been following this, this coastal migration to Australia. So this is the reason we think that the Australians were able to get from Africa to Australia so quickly. Yes. Is that they followed a coastal route. There is absolutely no uh, archaeological evidence for the existence of an ancient man in this South India. Right. Let's, let's get it on the map. Given what you know about the people living in southern India, which population should we sample? Yes, there are many. As we worked out which villages to test, the full reality of our experiment hit me. We were looking for a needle in a haystack the size of India. But Professor Pichapan was upbeat. Maybe after your study, the, it may prove that the genetic evidence is better than archaeological evidence alone, probably, right? Well, with any luck. Yes. The following day, I set out to sample an isolated village west of Madurai. This is exactly the sort of thing Luca started doing all those years ago. These villagers are a prime sampling group. They've lived in this region for generations with few outsiders marrying in. 
The more indigenous and isolated these people are, the easier it should be to find the ancient marker. If it's here. And address? Genes are passed down through generations. So first off, I take a detailed family history. Okay, age? Uh, 55. And intercaste marriage? Okay. Okay. Mother tongue? Uh, mother tongue, Tamil. Okay, religion? Um, Hindu. <laughs> Remember I only sample men? The thing is, without the male Y chromosome, my hunt for markers would be virtually impossible. Let me explain why. Chromosomes come in pairs. We inherit one from each of our parents. With each new generation, the two chromosomes get chopped up and reordered making each baby a unique combination of their parents. When that happens, it's bad news for me because I lose my marker trail. It's chopped to pieces by this genetic shuffling. But the Y chromosome is different. It doesn't get reordered every generation. Instead, it passes unchanged from father to son. And so do its markers, creating a perfect genetic trail for me to follow. But of course, men don't travel alone, and the journey of man is the journey of everyone. Somewhere here, 50,000 years after his journey, I hope to find the marker of the ancestral grandfather of the Aborigines. It feels good to be out in the field. Every sample you take, you can't help but wonder whether this guy will be the one. But the next stop is the lab. There, it's death or glory. You thought I'd hung up my lab coat. Well, so did I. We've managed to collect several hundred blood samples from around the Madurai region. It's, it's taken us days and days and days of work. And now we've got them in the laboratory, we've got a huge amount of work still to do. It's not just about collecting the sample. Because we have to go through a purification procedure before we can get to the DNA and find this marker we're looking for. The first step involves getting rid of the red blood cells, the things that you might think of when you imagine blood, the stuff that carries the oxygen around your body. Then we get rid of the rest of the proteins and we get down to a solution which is quite pure. We're ready for the last step, getting the DNA out of that. We want to add something to dehydrate the DNA molecules. So we add isopropyl alcohol. With any luck, we will see the DNA come out of solution. Looks a little bit like cotton at this stage. And there it is. I love this stage. I've done it thousands of times, and yet it still amazes me every time it happens. And it really is the essence of what we're looking at. This molecule is a historical document. Now the final stage, down inside the solution, and snag the DNA, and lift it out. Voila. Pure DNA. And there we go. And ready to move on to the next step. We store the DNA samples in a refrigerator to preserve them. So far, so good. Now we have to analyze this stuff. It's a two hour process. Then we've got another 300 samples to go. We are going upstairs to the sequencing machine to load the samples on. And the idea behind this machine is that it's a bit like a sieve, a molecular sieve. Um, and it's going to separate the sequencing reaction products on the basis of their size, their length. And by reading up a ladder of these, we can actually tell what the DNA sequence is, the sequence of, of letters in the code, A, C, G, G, T, and so on. Um, quite a high-tech machine. Pretty exciting piece of kit. Um, and it's right down here in this room. <laughs> 